This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, a look at black American inventors before the Civil War. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Prospects for a smart black kid, grandson of a slave, born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1899. What hope could he hold? Those were Percy Julian's circumstances. Julian went to the so-called State Normal School for Negroes in Montgomery. It was a second-rate high school, yet still available to very few. From there, he gained entry to DePaul University in Indiana as a remedial freshman. He studied chemistry, and he finished as class valedictorian in 1920. By hook and by crook, he managed to earn a master's degree at Harvard and a Ph.D. degree in Vienna. Percy Julian went back to DePauw to do basic work on drug synthesis. He established his reputation by synthesizing the drug used to treat glaucoma. But a black man could not yet be promoted to the professorial ranks, even in the North. So Julian became a research director at the Glidden Paint and Varnish Company. There he synthesized soybean products. He created sizing for paper and textiles. He used soya protein to make firefighting foam. He also synthesized hormones, progesterone and testosterone from soybean oil. He patented an early liquid crystal. Percy Julian is most famous for having synthesized cortisone. When he began, we had to make cortisone from the bile of oxen. It cost hundreds of dollars per drop. Julian located a wild sweet potato in Guatemala. He figured out how to synthesize cortisone from yams for pennies a gram. In 1954, he created his own pharmaceutical company, which he eventually sold for millions of dollars. 
In the end, he held over a hundred patents, and those patents represented palpable improvements in the quality of our lives. In the end, the chemical and academic communities heaped honors on Julian. Those honors included 19 honorary doctorate degrees. At least nine universities named schools and buildings after him. One was DePauw, which once could not promote him into the professorial ranks. Julian died in 1975. He'd lived most of his life in a world that simply didn't want to see his race. So, we return to our question. What were Julian's prospects in 1899? The answer, of course, is he created his own prospects. He walked around barriers and gave us far more than we gave him. We all see our lives proscribed by circumstance and by our own limitations. We miss the point if we take Percy Julian's story as one to be used only by black Americans. His transcendence is something for us all to seek out in our own lives. Today, ancient African ingenuity gives us steel. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Modern steel making began in 1847. William Kelly of Eddyville, Kentucky, found he could make superior structural iron if he blew air through molten pig iron. Oxygen from the air burned harmful elements out of the iron and formed a very strong carbon steel. The process gave what we call converter steel. Nine years later, the Englishman Henry Bessemer reinvented Kelly's method. Today, we talk about the Bessemer process for making carbon steel. But carbon steel had been made long before either Kelly or Bessemer. One of the oldest and most sophisticated methods was that of the Haya people. They're an African tribe in what is Tanzania today. The Hayas produced high-grade carbon steel for about 2,000 years. The Hayas made their steel in a kiln shaped like a truncated upside-down cone, about five feet high. They made both the cone and the bed below it from the clay of termite mounds. Termite clay makes a fine refractory material. The Hayas filled the bed of the kiln with charred swamp reeds. They packed a mixture of charcoal and iron above the charred reeds. Before they loaded iron ore into the kiln, they roasted it to raise its carbon content. The key to the high iron process was the high operating temperature. Eight men seated about the base of the kiln pumped air in with hand bellows. The air flowed through the fire in clay conduits. Then the heated air blasted into the charcoal fire itself. The result was a far hotter process than anything known in Europe before modern times. Anthropologist Peter Schmidt wanted to see a working kiln, but he had a problem. Cheap European steel products reached Africa early this century and put the Hayas out of business. When they could no longer compete, they'd quit making steel. Schmidt asked the old men of the tribe to recreate the high tech of their childhood. They agreed, but it took five tries to put all the details of the complex old process back together. What came out of the fifth try was a fine, tough steel. It was the same steel that had served the sub-Saharan peoples for two millennia before it was almost forgotten. This ancient African steel was the fruit of unalloyed human ingenuity. This complex metal flowing from simple native elements forms a mute tribute to the power of the human mind over matter. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston where we're interested in the way inventive minds work.